thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to introduce Patricia McConnell. She is a zoologist and certified animal behaviorist. Um, and she has written several really excellent books on understanding your dog's behavior. Um, there's her classic is for sale in the back. Um, unfortunately, I screwed up the book order and she has a brand new book that has just come out that you guys should all go and pick up the classic because it is like the definitive guide on understanding your dog's behavior. Um, and uh, then you should read that and then you should go and pick up her new book, The Education of Will, um, which is also available from Postman Books who does the books for these, but she'll be signing those at the end. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Patricia, thank you. Uh, thank you, Christine. Thanks for coming. Um, thanks Postman Books and Nick for bringing some books. We'll talk about different books. Hello. <laughs> Glad to see you. So, so the word is all over the country that Google is like this big dog lover group, right? which is so cool. <laughs> the fact that you have dog treat stations, I have to tell you, I'm just blown away. That's just like the coolest business practice I can imagine. So, so I would imagine most of everybody here loves dogs. Probably wouldn't be here, right? So here's the thing though. Just because you love dogs doesn't always mean you understand them, which makes a lot of sense because I really, really love lots of people in my life. Like, like let me ask you this. Do you always understand your partner, your husband, your wife, your mother, your child? Maybe not, right? Perhaps not always. So love doesn't always equal understanding. So what I'm going to talk about um, in the beginning is a little bit about tweaking. I mean, I'm guessing because you guys love dogs so much and this is such a dog culture that you're really pretty good at reading dogs. So I want to give the, the advanced level talk on reading really subtle signs of dogs and knowing how your behavior can have a profound influence on their behavior. That's a lot of what I talk about in the book, The Other End of the Leash, which is talking about humans as primates and dogs as canids and comparing our behavior, which is often um, gets along really, really well because like we both love to play. Um, but dogs hate to be hugged and primates hug all the time. So, so I'm actually gonna start by showing you a, a video. Um, it's an advertisement. And so what I want you to pay attention to is how the tiniest, tiniest movement can convey a huge, huge message, all right? So this is communication between humans. By the way, research in psychology shows she is actually actively flirting with him, touching the hair, looking over, more hair. Maybe not quite to that extent, though. <clears throat> Keep watching. There. Did you see the double take? How long did that last? It's like a third of a second, right? But it conveyed a great deal of information. So I'm going to show you another video, this time, between dogs. And there's a tremendous amount of communication going on between these two dogs. These are this is from the internet. Um, this is from Eastern Europe. These are two mastiffs standing over a spilled pile of kibble. And, and I will tell you right off the bat so that you're not stressed. There is no horrible injury. There is actually no fight here. Yes, it's OK. Don't you, trigger warning, not necessary for dogs. Um, <clears throat> I actually show a lot of videos. A lot of my work has been with aggression with dogs, and I've shown a lot of videos <clears throat> in which people were a wreck, and I learned I had to tell them, it's okay, <laughs> nobody's going to get bitten. So 
So here's your job. I, I show this video all the time to professional dog trainers. And here's the question I ask them and I'll ask you. When do you know which dog is going to get the food? One of the dogs gets the kibble without a fight. And I want you to call out when you first see a sign that you think you can predict which dog is going to get the food. All right, that was, that was a very clear cue, wasn't it? But you missed it. Yep, somebody else saw it. <clears throat> Watch the, dog, the head of the dog in the forehead, forehand. Watch the head turn to the right ever there. That's it. <clears throat> and watch what happens with the dog in the back. Oh. <clears throat> I can maybe move forward one inch and see what happens. And what happens is the other dog sits down. So they've already had an elaborate conversation. Don't feel bad if you missed the head turn. I didn't see it until I watched it the second or third time. So I'm going to keep playing it just because it's really fun <laughs> and interesting. And it's a wonderful example that, quote, dominance or, um, or something very different, force, those are not the same thing at all, um, force does not always get what you, get you what you want. Do um, you see the dog in the, the background? Do you see not looking directly at the other dog? A lot of blinking, see the blinky-eyed, blinky, blinky, blinky-eyed. A lot of appeasement behavior. It's like when you order something off the menu and go like, I'm so sorry, but could I have the sweet potato fries instead of the regular fries? <clears throat> this is appeasement behavior. But it's also a really smart strategic dog because I'm just doing one thing at a time to see what the result is. And you're getting two, th <laughs> I'm just gonna lie down. I just happen to lie down. Oh look, there's, there's, there's this right, I just, my nose fell onto the ground. Cool, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So we can also, communicate interspecifically, right? We can communicate between people and between dogs. However, we're not always accurate. Sometimes we get confused. You know, I talk in the other end of the leash about the fact that we interpret some things one way, dogs interpret them another. And I'm not actually going to talk about hugs today, but that's a perfect example. Primates of almost all species, especially apes, of which we are, as you well know, of which we are one, are huggers. We hug for a variety of reasons. We hug to express love, we hug to express solace, we hug to give comfort. A hug to a dog is a threat. You ever see dogs hug in a dog park? No, when one dog puts an arm over the shoulders of another dog, it's, it's, it's an offensive move. It's not aggressive necessarily, but it's a controlling offensive move that means I'm on offense, you're on defense, and I'm in charge. So how many people get bitten when they hug their dog? I can't tell you. I mean, I had so many clients who got bitten because they hugged a dog that they didn't know, and the dog took it as a threat, and the person thought they were expressing love and comfort. So we need to interpret these things correctly. And it turns out some of us are, not surprisingly, a lot better than others at it. This is the work of Michelle Wan. Michelle Wan got her PhD based on a research project in which she videoed I think there were 12 videos of dogs, of real short videos that people have sent in, of dogs behaving in different ways. And then she asked people, thousands of them, she did it online, she asked thousands and thousands of people to tell her, to rank, how stressed this dog is. Is the dog frightened? Is the dog happy? Basically, rate the emotional state of the dog you're looking at. So I'm going to ask you, before I tell you, I'm going to ask you to rate this one. So what would you say about this dog? Um, yes, and the first thing I would ask, is it hot? 
Is it hot outside? Um, but stress, absolutely. And here's, here's what turned out to be, I guess not shocking, apparently shocking to some, um, but, but, but still really, really interesting, is she rated people based on how much experience they had with dogs. Are you a PhD certified applied animal behaviorist? That would be me. Are you someone who has never had a dog? Are you someone who's had a dog all your life? but just one dog at a time. And, and not surprisingly, the more experience people had, the more likely they were to say this dog, for example, was stressed. Lots and lots and lots of people who, who had dogs and loved them but didn't have a lot of experience with them said this dog is happy and friendly. And there's something that... <laughs> Love dog talk. So I want you to watch something. Did you pay attention to the hindquarters of this dog? Look at its hindquarters. Something's wrong physically with that dog. So one of the things I would have said is, I want to take this dog to a sports medicine physiologist because he's not putting any weight on his back end, especially his back, right? So there's just so much we can see if we get really, really good at paying really careful attention. So let's start with facial expressions because we are primates after all, and facial expressions are incredibly important to us. Um, and as it turns out, they're important to dogs too. Dogs are highly social. Social animals tend to have very plastic, labile faces that are emotionally expressive. So um, compare a dog's face and all the different expressions you can see on a dog's face with a panda bear. Right? Panda bears are adorable. I mean, they're incredibly cute. And they're just vicious as hell, basically. That's not fair to say to them. But they're asocial. They're solitary animals. They, they don't need to express emotions or what they're about to do in their face. And, and you can just look across the board. Who loves horses here? You have horse lovers? Um, horses are highly social, but they don't have an elaborate social system as dogs and primates do. And I think part of the reason we get along with dogs so well is their faces are so plastic and expressive. And as we'll find out, many of their expressions are very similar to ours. So <laughs> if you compare, and I did this, um, one of my other books is, is For the Love of a Dog, Understanding Emotions in and in, um, People in Your Best Friend. I knew that there was a lot of similarity between expressions of people and expressions on dogs' faces, but I honestly, I had no idea how much until I wrote that book. I was blown away. If you analyze it down to the level of individual muscles, literally the same muscles get moved when dogs are happy, when dogs are fearful, when dogs are angry. So on the, um, on the left, you can see um, fear. And by the way, the photos, of the people are from Dr. Paul Ekman. He's a psychologist. He went around the world studying expressions of emotions in a range of cultures and basically found that um, people look happy or sad or frightened no matter what culture they are, whether they're a New Guinean pre-industrial hunter-gatherer society. They look happy when they're happy in the same way that we look happy when we're happy. Um, which, by the way, when it came out in the, oh man, what was it? I think it was maybe the 40s and 50s. It was really controversial. It was when Margaret Mead came out, was talking about the importance of culture and, and how so much was enculturated and so little was genetic. And that was sort of a hot belief perspective at the time. And Ekman came out and said, yeah, but expressions are actually universal. He got trashed. I mean, somebody poured water on his head at a scientific conference. I'm serious. If you think science is like this, I don't need to tell you. I mean, really, you know, like people can get very agitated. Um, so it turned out Ekman was right. Margaret Mead was wrong. But if you compare, it's not just within people across the world. It's also within species. Because frightened dogs, do you see the corners of the mouth? Frightened dogs pull the corners of their mouth back. Um, the commissure is the corner of your mouth. So it's a retracted commissure, and when we're frightened, we do the same thing. Um, the eyes also do, the muscles around, the preorbital muscles around the eye do the same thing. Happy, relaxed faces on people and dogs are very similar. 
relaxed muscles, sort of open face, and very often an open mouth. And I'm going to talk about mouth in a minute because that's one of the ways to keep from getting bitten by a dog you don't know. Anger. Now, this is more controversial. I actually gave a talk at the National Institute of Health, and I was talking about this work and making the comparisons. And I said the faces of a dog when it's angry is the same of a fa similar to the face of a person when they're angry. And after my talk, a, a professional, a veterinary behaviorist actually stood up, literally and ironically shaking with anger, <laughs> and said, how dare you talk about anger in dogs? That's an anthropom anthropomorphic attribution that has no basis in fact, and you're gonna, and then she sort of launched. And, and I was like, I've never been quite that attacked <laughs> publicly. Um, and so when I sat down, uh, a, one of the leaders in the field of anthrozoology, James Turple, said, what the hell did you do to her? <laughs> you know? but, but what I did to her was I suggested that the, the, the paragons of love, you know, the dogs who give us non-judgmental positive regard and constant unconditional love could actually get angry. Well, the fact of the matter is, if a mammal could be fearful, they can get angry because those two things are paired together in the amygdala, and the flip side of fear is anger. And the, as we all know, I mean, ask anybody in the military, in the military, ask any police officer, who are you most, who is most dangerous? It's a, it's a, it's a frightened person, right? Frightened people can become, can become angry people, um, and they can get really dangerous. And when people are really angry, they make the mouth and the face of that woman on the top, right? And dogs. I'm not saying they ex they have the exact same emotional internal state, you know, of course they don't. I mean, I don't have the exact same emotional state of any of you out there. But it's a glass half empty and a glass half full. And what I will tell you is that a dog with a face like the, um, that dog on the bottom, that is a dog on offense, and that is the dog willing to do something. Anger is an emotion that provides energy. That's what anger is about. Anger is about providing energy to help you fight for your life, to fight for your baby's life. Um, and, and so when you get really angry, you know how you want to do something. And when you get smarter, you're like, just calm down. You know, just take a breath. You know? um, so this is a dog who, who has a valuable resource right under his paws. And somebody's about to take it away. That is not a dog I would reach my hand towards and take something away. Because it's telling me I am full of energy and I'm on offense and I'm willing to use it. So eyes, you know, what's more important in human communication than eyes, right? Eyes are really, really important. And as we all know in our species, and you all know with dogs, eye contact can be really friendly, especially really soft and squinty looks, or threatening. Um, people talk about hard eye. Hard eye is a, f is a round, fixed eye on a dog, it's really hard to get a photograph of because it doesn't last long. And if you get too close, you're going to get bitten. <laughs> um, I actually look for years. People said, watch for the dog. Watch for, because I'm specializing in aggression, right? So, so my mentors were like, watch for when the dog's eyes go hard. And I kept looking for it. And I was like, I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't know what they're talking about. And I'd ask them to describe it. And they were like, I don't know. It's just, I don't know what it is. I think what it is is um, the lack of, there, there are different levels of nystagmus, which is your eyeballs actually moving back and forth. It's a way of triangulating the world, gives your brain lots of information. So visually right now, just watching me or the screen, your eyeballs are actually going back and forth the tiniest little bit to triangulate to give you information about depth perception and location. Um, during certain potentially frightening or dangerous encounters, what happens is that stops. You get information from the brain that signals your neurophysiological system, and everything stops for a second. And I finally saw it on a dog. I want to, she uh, was visiting the farm. She grabbed a dead bird. I went to take it out of her mouth. And her. the coolest thing was that my body saw it before I consciously registered it. So I went to reach towards her, and, and I literally I just felt this, this gut warning system is like, ah, ooga, ah, ooga, dive, dive, you know? I was like, uh, I literally, I felt this chill in my body. And then I was like, cool, that's hard eye. I saw hard eye, I finally saw it. <laughs> so basically, usually it's not just the eye that goes still, it's the whole 
body that goes still. Anytime I'm working with a dog I don't know, I am watching for a loose body versus a still body. And one of the mistakes people sometimes make, relatively often, is they will sort of like, like we're told when we're kids, like be a tree, right? You know, so they'll go like this, and dogs are like, oh shit, they are like so dangerous because they're like totally stiff and still, and that's what dogs do when they're fearful and, and, and believe that they're um, in danger. So the dog on the bottom right, um, that's the dog actually in a shelter. This is a dog that would, that would literally scare me to death if I was on the other end of the leash because <laughs> the whole body is tense. Um, it's looking directly into the eyes of the person holding the leash, and it's a hard, direct stare. That dog is basically saying, make my day. Just move. Just give me a reason. Um, so that's when you start, you go really loose, and you sing. <laughs> La, 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 and then you try and distract the dog, and you say, hey, you want to go on a walk? If, you have, if you're dealing with a dog that you're worried about, if you say you want to go on a walk, you want, um, you want your ball, you want a treat or something, I, I can't tell you how many dogs I've flipped. Like, you know, there's this German shepherd, like, la, 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 outside somebody's door, because, oh, they forgot to take the dog who bites people when they come to visit. They forgot to take the dog inside. When I came out, and I get out of my car, and there's this huge dog going, like, la, 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 la. Um, and so I don't know how many times I've been like, you want to play ball? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> I do, yeah. <laughs> Distraction is really good. Um, the direct stare is a really big deal. And this is why a lot of kids get bitten. Because they get right in the face of a dog and they lean. Will he bite me? I don't know if he's so. They lean and they loom and they lean and they look directly into the face of somebody else. And it's funny because we should understand this. Because if you were walking down the street and somebody you didn't know walked up to you, you know, and just walked straight up to you, you know, and, and we're like, Oh, is this a group of zombs? <laughs> right? I'd friggin' kill him. I mean, right? So, but we do that to dogs all the time and we think it's good. Here are two individuals of different species who get that. Watch how hard they work to not look at each other. <laughs> nope, 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 don't see anything. Yep, nope, nope. nope. Yep, nope. Yep, yep. Yep. Ah. Yep. Now I can look. <laughs> I love that video. So, be really careful of direct contact. I meet a lot of dogs sideways and I lean backwards a little bit cuz we're going to talk about looming in a minute and how important that is. So still on eyes, I call this the anti-Botox dog trainer trick, <laughs> is squinty eyes in both humans and dogs usually means relaxed and happy. So I literally will meet dogs be going like, hi, how are you? Hey. So the more wrinkles you can get, the better. This is good. Wrinkles are good. Love wrinkles. Again, rounded eyes, aroused, um, and so... This dog on the left, that's a sled dog. I was at a sled dog race, and the dog's chained, right? So any dog who's trapped is going to be more potentially on, on sort of defensive, potential defensive aggression. Um, also, see the pupils? Holy moly. Um, that either widely dilated pupils, which also often means arousal or fear, or constricted pupils means that dog's about to attack you. This dog, however, is looking directly into the sun. <laughs> and it was snowy and really bright. So this dog's eyes are just trying to protect its brain from being burnt out, basically. So you do need to look at context. Whale eye. This is something trainers talk about all the time. So you meet a dog you've never met, or your own dog. Um, and somebody comes up to your dog, and your dog turns its head a little bit away. So here's who I'm greeting. And then and then turns the eyes back. So you see a lot of white of the eye. I call it the horror movie thing, where you're like watching and you're like, I can't watch, and then like, you can't not watch. 
Because if you're not watching, you may be killed by the whatever, you know, the monster thing. But it's like so scary, so you turn your head away, but then you look. So you get this white of the eye and the side of the eye. It's a classic example of a dog who's uncomfortable. So this is a poor little Roddy in a shelter who somebody went up to and said, you know, wussy wussy, do you want to come home with me? And, and the Rottweiler was like, I'm terrified of you. I'm not going to leave, but I'm not going to take my, I'm going to turn my head away, but I'm not going to take my eyes off of you. It's my favorite whale eye picture. This was brought to me when I was doing a seminar about um, the other end of the leash kind of stuff, primate versus canid, hugging, right? So look how happy that kid is. <laughs> Squinty, happy eyes, open mouth, oh, I'm so happy. Look how happy the dog is, right? Ner very nervous, it's the hugging. The dog is being hugged, scary. So the mouth is also really important. We, you know, I showed you pictures of this forward commissure. Um, and so a forward commissure doesn't necessarily mean the dog is angry, but it means it's on offense. So there's on defense. So when you see dogs playing, for example, you'll see one with the corners of the mouth back, and you'll see one with the corners of the mouth forward. It's not an area of the body people tend to pay attention to on their dogs very much, but start watching because it's very cool. So the wolves on the right, one is in a higher status situation. See the commissure is slightly forward. Dog in the back is doing a little tongue flick. That little tongue flick is often the sign of, um, of either appeasement or low-level anxiety. So you go to a vet clinic, you'll see tongues just flapping everywhere. Just, you know, tongue flick, tongue flick. Horses do it too, by the way, and it turns out that so do people. So that's another thing to watch for. Um, when you're meeting with somebody, you see them do this a lot. They're nervous or they're anxious. Or their lips are really dry or I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> have an overactive tongue. So this is the classic scary dog, right? This dog is terrified. And we know it's terrified because the commissure, look at the commissure. It's like you can't pull, that is a fear grimace as big as you can make. That dog's really terrified. And you see the muscles over the eyes? See how they're contracted? The, the eyebrow like area is like pushed medially and down in the classic I'm worried position. It's the same thing that people do with their faces. So what we're looking for, <coughs> if, you, if you wanna know if your dog is relaxed and happy, you're looking for neutral eyes, relaxed muscles, and especially that open mouth. I, I can't tell you how many clients I had come to my office and they'd say, here's Barney. And I'd say, I'm just gonna let Barney just walk around the office and sniff the carpet. Barney's looking pretty nervous. His mouth is like glued shut. Um, and he looks pretty tense and you know every action is sort of stiff. I'm just gonna not pay attention to him. And I will wait, and I actually have in my notes, every client I see how long it took the dog to open his mouth. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful way to pay attention to a dog. So let's talk tails for a minute. Um, just watch this video and just watch how much is going on. So you can see tails are moving in a whole variety of ways, right? So I think of dog's tails as another, I'm gonna play it again a couple of times actually, as another equivalent of the human mouth. So it's like a smile. So we can smile in a whole variety of ways, right? So there's a like, oh, hi, I'm so, thank you for coming. I'm so glad to see you. There's a true smile that affects the, it's called a Duchenne smile that affects um, the muscles around the eye. So watch for people's eyes to get crinkly because if they don't, they're not, that's, then there's that social smile. There's the like, right, right. Oh, what an interesting sweater, <laughs> right? There's that smile. So dogs can do the same things with their tails. Dogs can move their tails in a myriad of ways, um, some of which you're looking for a big, wide, sweeping, relaxed tail where all the muscles are relaxed, tail is sweeping back and forth. That's a relaxed dog. But I have had literally over 100 clients who said to me, his tail was wagging, 
And so we thought he was fine. And so that's why I, I went to pet him, or that's why I let my friends pet him. Wagging tails are no more a sign of happiness than any, all versions of smiles are signs of happiness. Um, the kind of a stiff body, base of the tail not moving, and just top of the tail moving, we think what that means, we're not sure, but the research suggests that's a dog who is basically encouraging, um, decreasing the distance between it and another individual, but not necessarily for good purposes, <laughs> all right? So, so there's also some research about the direction of tail movement makes a difference. So pay, let's just watch one dog now. Pay attention to the little black and white terrier cross. Watch that dog's tail. So see it's mostly moving to one side, right? Now it's freer and bigger, and now it's went over to the right. See that? So it turns out, whoop, it turns out there's research that tells us perhaps what this means. And I have to tell you, I watched relaxed sweeps versus stiff, wag, stiff wags, but I never paid attention to which way a dog's tail was wagging until this research came out. So this Italian researcher, Coranta, did this really great work um, in which basically he, he um, they quantified the, uh, the sweep, um, the, the magnitude, and the direction of, of a tail wag. They had a device overhead, and so they watched it straight down from a bird's eye view. They quantified it. Um, depending on what was approaching the dog. Was it an owner? Was it a dog that the dog had never met? And so basically what they found was illustrated perfectly by that terrier. So there was a right side bias towards the owner or something the dog was comfortable with, just like you saw with a terrier who was meeting that really sweet, soppy little golden who was in that super appeasing position with its tail flattened, right? Super, mind is high. I'm glad to see you. Um, and as soon as it was greeted by that dog, the tail went to the right. When it was being greeted by that husky that it had, that I would suggest, given the tail posture and the way the husky came up, the, the terrier was a little intimidated by, it went to the left side. So go home and start watching your dog's tail. And I'll tell you it's awful because you're going to, for like a couple of days, you're going to be like, I don't know, is it go which way? <laughs> And then once I was walking down the stairs and my dog's tail kept going to the, to the left, I was like, oh no, my dog doesn't love me. Uh, but I was walking down, he's at the bottom of the stairs and I'm walking down the stairs, this is Willie. And then when I got to the stairs, it switched to the other side. So pay a lot of attention because I think we have a lot to learn. Obviously we have a lot to learn. It's really fun stuff. So looming, um, I, I referenced this a little bit earlier. Looming over dogs is the perfect way to get bitten. And I would guess, honestly, and I'm making this number up completely because nobody's done the research, but I would almost guarantee you it, it, it causes 50% of the bites in this country. Because one, little kids don't know not to do it. The most common demographic of a dog bite is a five to seven year old boy. Are we surprised? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, um, and, and kids don't know. You know, they really don't know. They run up and they want to hug and they want to loom and they want to do that high unit thing right in faces. But, you know, even if nobody's reaching out to peck, look, look at the um, physics of this. I mean, it's really, or the geometry. It's really, really simple. When dogs are confronting others, and some would call this a dominant posture. We can talk about the D word later if there's time. It's very controversial. Um, it's been misinterpreted and misused just relentlessly. Um, but so when dog is in, in an offensive position and another dog is in a defensive position, they loom. And I actually had, I had somebody, I think it was on my blog, who wrote, I have a dog who, who never bites, there's this case where the dog never ever bites another dog, but a dog park sort of knocks dogs over and then stands over them and then won't let them up. Is that aggression? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's called really serious bullying behavior. You know, you can, I mean, little dogs on the bottom, they can be terrified by that. I mean, it's just jerks. It's just, 
So if you have a dog who does that, then teach them, to, it's, it's not that hard, just teach them to call, be called away when you ask them to, you know, when you ask them. So it would be like, that'll do, here, here. So if you have a dog like that, you need to be sure that you have enough obedience on that dog, enough training on that dog, you can just call them away, because it's really rude. But also, when you meet a dog you don't know, be really thoughtful about this versus this. Because one of the cool things about my field in zoology was ethology, which is a lot about what's well, about behavior in the field, but I specialize in communication. And one of the things we all know is that a tiny shift, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna lean one way or the other, like a half an inch, okay? So tell me which way, am I leaning forward or backwards? So that was like, I couldn't move less. <laughs> I don't know how much I move, but it's not possible to move less, right? And you saw it, you all saw it, right? Um, I mean, that's a tiny bit forward, right? Dogs are brilliant at reading this. So when I read, when I meet dogs who are defensively aggressive, the first thing I do is I stand sideways because I don't want to loom, right? I stand sideways and I put my weight on my back leg because that's a huge cue to them. They got it. I'm already saying, I'm not going after you. I'm back here, we're good. I'm the dog, I'm the mastiff who's gonna get the food, but I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> we're, versus the other dog who's like, yeah, 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 who got nothing, um, because again, force doesn't always get you what you want. This is an ancient old video, so I apologize for the, um, for the quality. <clears throat> but this is my Lassie, long since gone, bless her adorable, sweet ice cream little heart. Um, Lassie was just learning to work sheep. And she's at a friend's farm. This is Beth Miller. And she's working sheep who have baby lambs. Sheep are not, people think sheep are defenseless, de defenseless frightened, docile. Yeah, they're not. They have heads like anvils and they can like smash you into the ground. Um, and they usually don't choose to do that, but the mothers who have babies who are being, being faced with a predator, right, a canid who could eat their babies, they can be very defensive. So watch Lassie and watch the way, she, watch where her center of gravity is and watch the effect that it has on the sheep and then we're gonna compare it with another dog. So these are sheep with lambs in a corner, which is like sheep herding graduate school, basically. So see the black face just challenged her? And Lassie was like, oh shit, I'm, I'm gonna go over here, right? So Beth is doing the right thing, she's protecting the dog. I've had to do this with my current dog. You basically have to teach them. They don't know they have teeth in their mouth, right? Life's not fair. So I'm actually going to Fast forward to the opposite. So Lassie became a great herding dog. So this is an older dog who's the opposite. And watch the direction of his energy and watch the reaction of the sheep. So this is a very confident older dog who's being asked to walk up. So each step predicts that he's gonna move forward the next time, right? She puts her a little, char, a little try here, so she just went a little forward, and the dog was like, mm, yeah, that's gonna get me closer. <laughs> and now he does a really wise thing, which you might think is weak, but it's actually strategic and really smart. He's gonna get attacked or threatened, and he's gonna lie down, which is brilliant, because it's like, I don't wanna get in a fight with you. It's good, girl. we're good. Do you see the stomp? Do you see the black face stomper? She just turned, so he just, it's like, yeah, we're good, but I'm not backing up an inch. I'm gonna lie down to take the pressure off of you, but I'm not backing up an inch, not a half an inch, not a quarter of an inch. I'm just here, and you're gonna leave the corner. Yes, you are. We're good, girls. And there we go. So, isn't that a great example? So pay a lot of attention when you're meeting a dog where your body is because believe me, your dog is paying a lot of attention. Here's a, another not particularly great video. This is just actually me teaching two dogs to stay using a combination of positive reinforcement. They've never heard this command before. I would never normally throw a treat behind me to, to test them. Normally I would just be giving them treats. 
you see that she shook off a little bit? That was just, oh, what happened? I'm a little nervous here. So this is Diesel. He's, he's never been taught stay. And again, I would normally never go that fast. So I body blocked him, just using my body, never touched him. And then I gave him treats for being where I wanted him. And I'm going to do it again. This is only the second time this dog has ever been told stay. And, and, and wash, wash my face. It's like, holy God, this stuff works. How cool is that? Right? So one of the things, I don't have time to talk about sound very much. Um, that was what my PhD was actually on sound. And basically, basically reminds us that short, rapidly repeated notes like pop, 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 encourage dogs, speed dogs up and good dog, stay, lie down, soothes and slows them. But after that, after spending all these years studying sound, I started training in classes and I discovered that mostly the dogs were preferentially paying attention to visual signals. And so that's the biggest thing you could learn from today. Your dog is always watching you. All this stuff comes out of our mouth because we're primates and humans. They're watching you and that overrides what you have to say. Here's a little study I did. We taught dogs to sit and stay to a visual signal and simultaneously an acoustic signal and then tested them one by one. So the five Border Collie puppies all did better. They had five possible correct answers, five out of five visual, puppy one through four. Acoustic, mm, not so good, right? These are the beagles. This is my that will teach you to call your beagle when running in the woods data set, right? So none, so they were all taught to sit to a sound and an action, and none of them paid attention to the sound at all whatsoever. So one, one of the things to think about is that, is that every signal, if you think about it ecolog ethologically from, from my background as a zoologist, every cue, every movement, every signal has a message from the sender to the receiver um, and the, what the receiver gets is the meaning. So when we analyze cues and, and um, signals like movements, like leaning forward, we're always asking ourselves, is it an expression of the internal state? Is it a predictor of future behavior? Or is it an attempt to influence another? And what I want to focus at the end of my talk is the internal state. These are, of course, all combined, right? Internal state will often tell you what the animal is about to do. Um, and often is an attempt to influence the behavior of another. But I want to focus on, on the um, internal state and emotions right now because emotions in animals are actually still very controversial. Um, this is an email I got after one of my um, books came out. Tell Patricia she's a naive, sentimental fool for believing dogs love us. What total bullshit. Dogs don't love us. It's modified groveling pack behavior due to selective breeding. Dogs are lobotomized wolves. I would argue that our relationship with each other is actually modified groveling pack behavior um, because, <laughs> because we're all doing it to meet our own needs, right? You know, I love my husband. I, I, you know, I'm happy to do groveling modified pack behavior to keep him happy because he's a wonderful man and I, you know, I love him and I like being married. Um, so yeah, we're all doing that and it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that, that dogs don't have emotions. So here's a very quick video of a somewhat controversial emotion, which is um, jealousy. Some people think dogs can be jealous. Some people think, oh, only humans can be jealous. It's a secondary, more complicated emotion. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece he eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. <laughs> she tests a rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. 
and she gets cucumber again. <laughs> and if that's not jealousy, I don't know what is. Um, I think it's a very simple emotion, basically. I think, of course, dogs can be jealous. It's just sort of angry because they're not getting something somebody else is getting. And I don't how how cognitively complicated do you have to be? However, there's another emotion is often I think misattributed to dogs often, which is guilt. Right? You came home, your dog ripped up the pillow, and you and and your dog is like, Ugh, right? And he looks guilty. I know he knows he shouldn't do that because he looks guilty. Here's a summary by my colleague Julie Hecht who did work with Alexander Horowitz at Columbia here on guilt. Did you hear? This dog went viral, right? You guys saw this, right? So this... Come here. Let me see. Let me see your face. So this, by the way, is an expression we didn't have to talk about. It's, it's appeasement. It looks like smiling. It's cuter than hell, but it's appeasement. It's not guilt. The dog was on Good Morning America, became so famous. So the experimenter's going to lie. Say the dog Come ate it. Come back in. She ate it. What did you do? All right. You there do? it is. <clears throat> that is appeasement. It is not guilt. Am I saying dogs can never be guilty? Uh, I'm not saying they can't, but it's very rare. Um, and mostly what we're seeing is appeasement. And if they're really different, and we need to pay attention to it. So there's a lot, if you're into dog cognition, um, I won't spend too much time on it, but there's a phenomenal amount of research going on about canine cognition and the mind. Um, Gregory Burns taught dogs using nothing but positive reinforcement to lay absolutely motionless in an MRI machine. How cool is that, right? And so they're doing MRI brain studies on dogs, and, and all kinds of really wonderful stuff is coming up. One of the things that we need to understand more about, and I'm going to end talking about a, a uncomfortable emotion, the emotion of fear. Honestly, every behaviorist that I know agrees that 90, at least 90% of the serious behavioral problems, especially aggression that people have with dogs, relates to fear. People are very bad at reading fear on the face of a dog. Um, I can't tell you how many times people have misread a fearful face as a happy face or just not seen more subtle signs of it. Their dogs are tiny. We're big. We have all the power. Dogs are often very fearful. This little puppy, this is Will, who's on the cover of, of the book that's not here, The Education of Will, which is my memoir that just came out. But postmans will get it for you. So yay for them. Um, so this is Willie as a little puppy. Absolutely adorable, right? And he's a wonderful dog. He's, we, uh, Jim and I live on a farm. He's a working sheep dog. He loves to play with other dogs. Um, he's just a great, wonderful dog, um, except when he's not. Um, and actually, this slide makes me unbelievably happy because this was just taken last summer. And he's giving what I call snake face to a hound cross who's visiting. It's an adolescent male, just being a typical, sorry, adolescent male, <laughs> just doing goofy, silly things and sort of jumping on top of Willie. And Willie was, was communicating, don't do that anymore. And this is not a very nice face on, on the face of William. However, I am thrilled with this photograph because when Willie was a year old or two years old or even two and a half, this would have resulted in a horrific attack. I never would have let this happen. Willie came to me as a puppy as if he'd come back from three tours in Afghanistan. And it turned out that unbeknownst to me, I thought I'd healed from all these traumas. The education of Will is about, do about dogs and people um, facing and healing from trauma. And um, it turned out that I thought I was good, and then Willie came, and he was super sound reactive and really problematic and super aggressive in all these contexts, and he ended up setting me back. 
He sent me quite a ways back. Um, and I finally figured out that in order to heal him, uh, I had to heal me. So dogs like these, these are scared dogs. Now, I'm not saying they won't bite you. <laughs> they might if you do the wrong thing. Um, of course, you have to protect yourself. But fear, again, is a very, very powerful emotion and can take over the behavior of a lot of dogs. Dogs don't need this. Oh, this, by the way, that slide I started with, see the whale line now, right? This dog is telling you, please go away from me. I'm afraid of you. Not quite as big a signal, but still a very clear signal. There's a very clear whale eye. So fear is a really primal, primal emotion. And it's shared between all mammals. You all know about the amygdala, holds the key. And fear out of balance can create trauma. If you want to talk to me about it later I'm, or any questions, I'm happy to talk about it. But basically, I've been traumatized. I was raped. I was sexually molested earlier. Um, and a man fell from the sky five stories and landed there and died at my feet when I was about 17. And it changes your brain. And I thought I was good. I thought I was healed. And then Willie came, and he was super sound reactive, and he sent me back. So all my PTSD symptoms came back. So that's what the education of Will is about. Um, Willie is good now. He's 10. He's really good. I would never bring him here to meet your dogs, but if he was outside and saw your dog on the streets, he'd be like, hi, are you a dog? I'm a dog. He was incredibly dog-dog aggressive. He'd be like, good, hi, how are you? Um, I am really good too. I went through periods where I didn't sleep for months. I couldn't go into a dark building. Um, and so I write about that in The Education of Will. Um, it's, I, I promise you it's a happy story, but it does talk about trauma and how dogs can be traumatized too and how they don't need dominance. They don't, don't buy into any of this alpha, you have to dominate your dog to get your dog to listen to you. That's just, that's, there's no science behind that. People just made that up, and it felt good. <laughs> I think dogs need a sense of safety and security, so you need to be a benevolent kind of a leader. Um, but leader is a word that's actually been compromised in some senses too. So, so. What dogs need is to feel safe and secure and like they can trust you, and they can trust you to read their communication, um, and they can trust um, that you will communicate clearly with them. So thank you. It's really fun to be here to talk to all these dog lovers. I'm happy. Do you want me to answer a few questions up here? Um, I'm happy to sign books back there. Where's Christine? Where's Alex? Do we have time for a few questions? Are we good? And you can ask me anything. You can ask me about, I don't know, hashtag me too. You can ask me about your dog peeing on the carpet. You can, you can pretty much ask me anything about behavior. And if I don't know, I'll say, I don't know. Hi, thank you so much for coming. This was amazing. Thank um, you. I have a beautiful one-year-old 100-pound burner. And as you can imagine, she's a pretty big, fluffy target. A Bernese mountain dog. Bernese mountain dog. The streets of New York. And um, I know management is the first key for dog behavior. So, But try as you might, people... Patter oh, or, yes, loom you know, and reach, so yes. So just curious, one, like for the times when you can't manage those situations, like what's the best way to either like educate and then just, you know, make sure she's not scared or just kind of like salvage a situation that happens probably 10 times a day. Um, so you're asking me to influence human behavior. Well, or how can That's I? That's far hard. No, I'm just I guess two things. <laughs> you, aren't, aren't you guys good at this? I, I had asked that <laughs> that and I, I was wondering if you It's hard. It is. I really sympathize. Yeah, or like just talking more about like, um, appropriate greetings for like strangers on the street, which is like a common New York City dog owner. Right. right. Yeah, no, great questions. It's really fun. I mean, I live, Jim and I live in the country outside of Black Earth, Wisconsin, right? Now, I work and teach in Madison, Wisconsin, which is the capital, of the, you know, of the capital state. Um, beautiful urban place, but nonetheless, we live on a farm. So it's so fun for me to walk around New York and think about like, oh my God, my dogs would be freaking out if they were here. So a couple of things. And one, I'll just answer the most extreme sort of extreme intensity of the level. I have had clients who literally taught their dog to wear a muzzle, not because the dog needed it, because people don't pet dogs with muzzles on. Which is amazing, because you know when they have a muzzle on, they're safe, <laughs> theoretically, right? You'd have to be careful. Don't ever use a, a, a cloth muzzle. You always want to use a big basket muzzle if you do that. But I literally had clients to do that, to just literally protect their dog. Um, another thing you can do is always teach your dog to sit in back of you. I do a lot of body blocking to people, lots. So I'd work with a lot of dogs who were fear aggressive to unfamiliar people. 
And when we were doing conditioning programs, I literally, the dog was always back here and I was always really quick to body block the person. Um, and sometimes you have to be somewhat assertive. It's, uh, um, especially with dog lovers, you know? Um, and, and this is just speaking as a, as a zoologist, I will tell you that in general, women will ignore you and reach towards to pet the dog and say, oh no, 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 dogs love me. I have, I have, a, I have a way with dogs. And, and, and guys are more like, I'm not afraid. You know, it's like, it's not about you. <laughs> it's about the dog, you know. So I literally, I, so if I, if I lived in New York, um, I literally would teach my dog when somebody, this would be the cue, and I wouldn't be a cue for me. I would start with a cue for me. So it would be like, back, and I would teach a dog, if I see somebody about to do this, it would be so your dog steps back and is a little bit behind you so you can always protect them. Um, but but turn it into an auto cue. So turn it into the reach towards is a, I'm going back and I'm sitting down. Wouldn't be hard. Really wouldn't be hard. So that's one thing to do. And an, another thing to do is, is from a level of, oh, I'm so sorry. He's recovering from rabies. Or, you know, you know, <laughs> you know. Um, um, one thing I've done a lot, this is only if you have time, is, is I've said is – and. You need time, and you need to be far enough away. So I don't know how much it would work on the streets of New York. It's like, oh, you look like a dog lover. I know you're going to help me. I know you know not to come up and just reach towards the dog right away because you look like a real dog lover. And nobody is willing to say, like, yeah, I was about to reach towards your dog, right? So so does that help? Yeah, that's super helpful. So it, when they when they do ask, if they, like, the people that do the right thing, is the best way yeah. for, like, greetings just, like, a hand out and letting the dog decide? Yeah, side of the face. So one thing you can do is, you know, you're always good to give people something to do. So you can say, oh, I would love it if you pet my dog, but, um, but you know, here's what I'd love you to do. Would you take this treat, put a treat in their hand, and then, and then you illustrate and say, give him a treat like that. And so if you do it, half of them will do what you say. <laughs> the other half will just do it totally start wrong, and then you. Start what's that? Yeah. We'll start with the kids. Start. start yeah, yeah, good. Thank so you. you have one too. Yeah. So I have a uh, six-year-old dachshund. He's a rescue. He's uh, like Will. I'd say definitely traumatized. Like very dog aggressive. Yeah. Um, except like when I'm at the dog park, he's not that bad. It's sure. On a leash though. Terrible. Yes. Like very aggressive. Classic. Yeah. Um, and I've like gone through training with him. Like so he has a good foundation of. Of good, I'd say of like sit, stay, go to bed. Good, you know. Good. Um, so, but as far as you know, still being dog aggressive and even like strangers, very aggressive with strangers. Okay. Um, how you know? What are some? Yeah. Oh, I hear you. First yeah. of all, yay for you for rescuing that pup. Um, and, you know. Um, so here's the best thing I would do, and and I'll give you the really short version. The longer version is in a booklet I wrote called Feisty Fido. Um, so basically, you're going to combine operant conditioning, Skinner's four quadrants of positive reinforcement, right, plus classical conditioning. So the classical conditioning part is that your doxy is going to learn, what's his name, her? Uh, Chaco. Chaco. So Chaco is going to learn that each movement towards him, and so remember to break it up into tiny steps. So say, oh, I wish he was here. So say Chaco's there with you. So I'm your friend. And I'm one of your friends who does what you say. So you eliminate half of them <laughs> because we're people. So, so you're going to ask your friend to walk forward one step and then stop. And as he walks forward, you're going to give Chaco a treat. And you might even, um, I like to put an operant conditioning cue on it too. So before he sees the person, you might say, Chaco, look at me. Or look at the person, like, who's that? I actually taught Will that. It's like, who's, who's that? So he looks at the person, click, you can, you can just say good, you don't have to have a clicker with you, um, but mark that behavior, and then you give him a treat. So first you're going to teach him an incompatible response. So if he's looking at you, he's not going to be going after somebody else. But at the same time, as you work on that, as people get closer, they're going to be ones, the ones throwing the treat. So it's step, throw, step, throw. And so he's being classically conditioned in a Pavlovian way of like, Person, chicken, person, chicken. I am no longer afraid of person. But you have to go really slowly, and what happens is it's really easy to do the first steps right and then go too far too fast, and then all of a sudden your dog just bit somebody. So, so do it way slower and longer than you think you need to, and you'll never be done. But just you can manage it, and he'll get better and better. Awesome. Thank you. So, yeah.
Hello, thank you Hi. for being here. Oh, thanks for coming. Good question. I also have a rescue and a lot of uh, fear, aggression. Okay. It's getting better now that living in New York City and having a lot more exposure to Yeah, people. good for you. But as a, a result of anxiety, she will never, she would never pee in the house no matter how long I stay and keep her in the house. Eight hours should be fine. Yeah. When I leave the house. Oh, she has she separation will, anxiety. You know, she will do it. And I don't know how to explain to her how to help her not be afraid that I'm gone. I, I will be back. So that's one. And then secondly, what is your uh, point of view on e-collar, electronic collars? Oh, okay. Two questions. Um, I'll answer the second one first because um, that's quicker. I hate them. Okay. I really, really dislike them intensely. Um, I've used, in 28 years or something, I've used them twice for dogs who were killing livestock and whose the owners of whose livestock had a gun and were going to shoot the dog if it happened once again, right? So that's the only situation I've ever used them in. Um, <laughs> sort of no, anyway. So um, back to your fear aggressive or your um, separation anxiety. Um, <clears throat> There, there's, again, the longer version is a book that I wrote called I'll Be Home Soon, but the, but the short version is, first of all, be sure that's what it is, because some dogs are like, she's gone, I can pee now. Um, but if that's what it is, then you need to start conditioning that. So basically, figure out the trigger. Mm -hmm. So can you tell a time your dog starts to get nervous when you're getting your keys, getting your coat, going in the bathroom, brushing your hair? Is there any sign she's getting nervous as you're leaving? So she's, she's kind of watching me, right, every move, following me. Yeah, okay. So watch her, watch her really carefully. Start to see when she shifts her behavior. And you'll see it. You know, she'll start to follow you around and figure out what is it you're doing and use that as your first trigger. So you're going to condition her, say, say these are my keys. So I'm going to pick up my keys, and then I'm going to throw a treat for her. And then I'm going to put them down. And I'm going to do that like 10 times in a row. And maybe part of the day, I'll just pick up the keys and go sit on the couch and watch television. So you deload the keys. And then you go, th you do that for each step. Keys, coat, every dog has a different set of triggers. Walking to the door, touching the door handle, opening the door two inches. You really do do this in tiny little increments. And eventually, um, you, you go outside for a second, then you go outside for 10 seconds, then 30 seconds, then five minutes. The end goes way faster than the, the, the beginning. Meanwhile, when you really have to leave her, find a different place, whether it's a, you know, one room, a crate, boarding count, or not, or a daycare, or something else, so you can separate those environments. So that's the quick answer. Yeah. Yeah. And I can hang around a little bit afterwards if you have more, but I know there's, so hopefully that helps a little Thank bit. You. Thank yeah. you very much. Hi. So, um, the other day I was playing piano and my dog like started like howling, and he's never done that before. <laughs> you hit the right note. I was playing piano. <laughs> so his dog howls when he plays piano. I love it. Nobody quite understands it, but you know, howling is contagious. Howling is a social function. I th it, we we think it's sort of like singing in church. It's a way of bonding animals together. So you're just hitting exactly the right note that somehow is a salient trigger for a dog. Basically, your dog thinks you're howling. <laughs> so you can either, I would put it on cue, and then you know do a video and put it on line. You know? <laughs> so I think one more, and then I know some of you have to go, but I can hang around and sign books and um, answer questions. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I have an eight-month-old golden, golden doodle in the city, and we've had him for four months, and he's scared of a lot of things, oh. um, but getting better, it's definitely getting a lot better like over the time we've had him, but he's still like um, super terrified of skateboards, especially, yeah. and oh. there's a couple other things, but it's like definitely skateboards. The worst, yeah. And I'm not, and I'm just curious like what I should do in the moment um, that happens, and he like wants to just freak out and run home. And my instinct is to like bend down and hug him, and I'm learning maybe that's not right. Maybe but not. What you... <laughs> yeah, right. I'll um, torture you while you're scared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But you're a primate, and you love him, and you're trying to provide solace, right? Yeah. So here's what I first first of all, skateboards. This is like ubiquitous. I cannot tell you how many dogs freak out, and I think it's partly because of the vibrations and the low level noise. It's a growl. That's why dogs are afraid of thunder. The world is growling, right? 
Um, so, so this low, this, it, it just scares so many dogs. So you can't control it you, necessarily. When it happens, as soon as you see one, you need to be like on constant alert, which I'm sure you are already. Yeah. So as soon as you see one, you're going to move away as far as you can, whatever that is, and then you're going to ask for a sit, good boy, good boy, and then you're going to give lots of treats, good boy, and if he looks at your face, good boy, I would teach a watch or look at me okay. and do that separately, so get that down where it's easy and it's not too scary for him, and then go somewhere where you know you, do you have places where you know they're going to be? Skateboards? Um, yes. Central Park, I mean, they're yeah, there you go. so yeah. some, predi some predictability, so stay as far away as you can and say, do you see, where's the skateboard? Where's the skate? Name your fears. It helps with dogs too. Where's the skateboard? Where's the, or, you know? Where's where's where is it? Where's the thing? Where's the thing? And if he looks, it's like good treat. And then you're going to back away also to reinforce him, because you're going to increase the distance between them. Um, and that so that's what I do. If you're blindsided, you don't have time for anything. I would just move. I would just walk away. Don't hug him. Don't pick him up. Just walk away. Get as far away from it as you can, and then work your way up to getting closer. Okay, thank you all. It was really fun to be here. I love your dog culture. Thanks, Christine, for asking me, and thank you, Alec.